Step into a world of wonder as we ponder, what if Deku became divine? Part 1 unveils the beginning of an epic journey. Don't miss out. Maybe you should give up, kid, the doctor's words cut deep into Izuku. What do you mean, doctor? His worried mother asked. Your son isn't just a mukasei, he lacks almost all his senses except hearing, which works at 50%, and his sight is very poor, nearly 7%, it should be impossible for the child to be alive, the doctor said bluntly. On the other hand, your daughter has the dragon breath you spoke of, which your husband possessed. Izuku's world, and his dream of becoming a hero, shattered. When everyone at school found out, they started mocking Izuku, while his former friend, Katsuki, became the green-haired boy's personal bully. Harumi joined in too. Both intensified their efforts upon learning that Izuku wished to become a hero one day, even resorting to using their kosais to hurt him. Strangely, it only took Izuku a couple of hours to get back on his feet each time. Every day followed the same pattern, Izuku expressed his desire to be a hero, Katsuki and Harumi told him he was just a mukasei, and then he endured explosions and burns from his best friend and sister, leaving him battered in the school playground after classes. They wanted him to understand that if he became a hero, he would die. Being a hero was dangerous, especially without a kosei and with his physical disabilities. It was always the same. He just wanted to be a hero. Why did they have to destroy his dream? His vision wasn't very good. His body was weak and thin. His stamina wasn't the best. His lungs and heart were only functioning at half capacity. But he didn't want to give up. He firmly believed that with courage, determination, and effort, he could make it. He remembered his mother once telling him that the doctor who brought him into the world said he was a miracle to be alive. She always reminded him to be grateful for being allowed to live in their home instead of obsessing over being a hero. If he pursued that dream, he would end up dead, she warned. He remembered Harumi sometimes appearing and burning him. Or his own mother causing a book to hit him, leaving him on the ground with fractures and heart problems from overexertion. He remembered coughing up blood, his skin cracking. And slowly, it got worse for him. One day, he didn't know how, but everything spiraled out of control. He was at the park with his mother and Harumi when a group of men emerged from the shadows, intending to rob them. Inko handed over all their valuables. Please, don't hurt my daughter or me. Begged Inko, embracing Harumi to prevent her from using her dragon breath, to prevent them from being killed. Please, let us go. Why should we do that? Asked the man, who then used his kosei, silver electricity, to electrocute Inko. As fast as she could, she moved a rock, turning it to ashes. Please. Let us go. But. If. If you insist. One of the men stepped forward, thinking the woman would offer her hot body to satisfy them. You. You. You can take my son and do whatever you want with him. The silence that followed those words was terrifying. Harumi opened her mouth. What was her mother saying? Why was she talking like that about her brother? He was her brother. He was her son. Why? Her conscience told her, you are the one who will be a superheroine. You are the one who will surpass All Might and provide Okasan with all the luxuries she deserves. She clenched her lips and then her fists. It's an acceptable sacrifice. What's worth more? A Mukasei, or the future number one hero? Without time to do anything, to answer the voice in her head, her mother dragged her away from there. Izuku Niazan, Harumi shouted, reaching out, desperate to reach him. The villain sold Izuku to an organ trafficker. The pain Izuku would suffer in the coming hours and, perhaps, days was more than anyone could bear. He wished to die. He wished to stop suffering, as he watched in horror as his organs were extracted and put into boxes made of what seemed to be styrofoam. But soon, the trafficker discovered something interesting about Izuku, he seemed to have a healing kosei. All it took was touching people. The trafficker underwent a new operation, healing the child and transplanting other organs so he would survive. And he became their new source of income, forced to use his kosei to save lives. Izuku Midoriya had lost track of how long he'd been stuck in that basement. But every few days, he knew it had been more than two weeks, more than fifteen days, that man who had bought him from those criminals would bring sick people for him to touch and heal, thanks to his primary kosei. Well, that was the last job of the day. Good work, kid, said the man before leaving. Izuku collapsed onto the filthy mattress, feeling his arms tremble from the prolonged use of celestial healing, his kosei. Another man arrived and handed the boy a plate of beans, which he ate with his hands, almost desperate, while both men left him there. Locked in darkness. When the boy fell asleep, he fell into a deep slumber, 
into the world of dreams. Wake up, little one, said a feminine and motherly voice. When Izuku opened his eyes, he blushed at seeing his head resting on the legs of a beautiful woman with blonde hair, almost completely naked, with only a couple of fig leaves covering her breasts, while feeling the woman's maternal touch on his hair. Don't be startled, everything's okay, young one, said a male voice. Izuku sat up slowly and saw a blonde man with some kind of blanket over his head, flowing down his body, physically, he was identical to the woman, who still had that maternal touch on him. He too was blonde, and his eyes were also dark blue. Who are you? asked the boy, looking at the woman and then the man. I'm Eva, said the woman softly. He's my husband, Adam. My ex-wife, Lilith, said Adam, pointing with his chin to someone behind Izuku and Eva. It's a pleasure to meet you, little one, said a short-haired redhead woman with golden eyes, dressed like a member of a biker gang. She wore a short red jacket, a yellow shirt underneath, and beneath that, some sort of fuchsia tank top. Fingerless gloves and red pants completed her outfit. I'm Lilith, ex-wife of the blonde man beside you, a smile appeared on her lips as the next words came out amusingly, and current wife of this other blonde. Undoubtedly, you have too many questions, don't you, Izuku? Asked the black-eyed, formally dressed blonde man. I'm Lucifer. Brother of Adam and husband of Lilith. And? How can I help you? Asked the confused boy. Lucifer ran a hand through his hair. We're within your mind, Izuku. We are souls that lived many millennia ago, and somehow, we all ended up together, transmigrating to you. Eh? Asked Izuku. So? Are you like? Guardian angels, suggested Adam. I was going to say something more like. Spiritual companions, admitted the boy. They all smiled. Lucifer snapped his fingers, and Adam and Eve were now wearing white and black kimonos. Much better. When Lucifer spoke again, his voice sounded tired, and he didn't seem sure of his words. Even we ourselves can't explain how we ended up in you. You were like a beacon for four very powerful and ancient moths. Your body holds an energy that isn't Kosei in itself, said Lilith. The truth, Izuku, is that you're not defenseless in this cruel world, with people. I'm not? asked Izuku. Lucifer's tired face turned to anger as he grabbed Lilith by the shoulder, causing her to complain and squeal as the angel forced her to her knees with his physical strength. Leave her alone. Begged Izuku, approaching and pushing him. Let's stop fighting among ourselves, growled Eva, standing between Lucifer and Lilith. Izuku thought that face didn't match the angelic appearance and aura of the woman at all. She sighed. What my? And is trying to say, Izuku, is that you have a great deal of chi. Chi? Asked Izuku, eyebrows raised as Adam, Lilith, and Lucifer looked surprised. Chi is the flow of life energy in every human being, explained Eva. Lucifer was the first angel of creation. Adam was the first human, Lilith was created to be Adam's companion and equal in every aspect, and I was created when Lilith left creation, she sighed. All living beings have a certain amount of life energy. We can use chi in ways no other human could, said Lucifer. My level is extremely high for being the first angel of creation. You four are only limited by your mortal bodies. Lilith gave her husband a look of superiority. Lilith started as just another human, but by using her connection to the Creator. She gained some special powers, on par with Lucifer's, and left me, said Adam seriously before laughing in Lilith's face, who seemed like she wanted to kill him. There are three forms of chi, said Lilith, adding her two cents. Divine or luminous, Lucifer's, mortal, Adam and Eve's, and demonic, mine. Midoriya Izuku had lost track of how much time he had spent locked in that basement. But every few days, he knew it had been more than two weeks, more than fifteen days, that man who bought him from those criminals brought sick people for him to physically touch and heal, thanks to his main kosei. Well, that was the last job of the day. Good work, kid, said the man before leaving. Izuku collapsed onto the filthy mattress, feeling his arms tremble from the prolonged use of celestial healing, his kosei. Another man arrived and handed the boy a plate of beans, which he ate with his hands, almost desperate, while both men left him there. Locked in darkness. When the boy fell asleep, he fell deeply into the world of dreams. Awake, little one, said a feminine and maternal voice. When Izuku opened his eyes, he blushed, seeing his head resting on the legs of a beautiful woman with blonde hair, almost completely naked, wearing only a couple of fig leaves over her breasts, while feeling the woman's maternal touch on his hair. Don't startle, everything is fine, young one, said a male voice. 
Izuku sat up slowly and saw a blonde man with a kind of blanket over his head, flowing down his body, physically, he was identical to the woman who still had that maternal touch on him. He too was blonde, and his eyes were also dark blue. Who are you? The boy asked, looking at the woman and then at the man. I'm Eva, said the woman softly. He's my husband, Adam. My ex-wife, Lilith, said Adam, nodding towards someone behind Izuku and Eva. It's a pleasure to meet you, little one, said a short-haired redhead woman with golden eyes, dressed like a member of a biker gang. She wore a short red jacket over a yellow shirt, and beneath that, a kind of fuchsia t-shirt. Fingerless gloves and red pants. I'm Lilith, the ex-wife of the blonde man next to you. A smile appeared on her lips as the next words came out amusingly. And current wife of this other blonde. Undoubtedly, you have many questions, right, Izuku? Asked the black-eyed blonde man in a formal suit. I am Lucifer, Adam's brother and Lilith's husband. And? How can I help you? Asked the confused boy. Lucifer ran a hand through his hair. We are within your mind, Izuku. We are souls that lived many millennia ago, and somehow, we all ended up together, transmigrating to you. Eh? Izuku asked. So? Are you like? Guardian angels, suggested Adam. I was going to say something more, like. Spiritual companions, the boy admitted. They all smiled. Lucifer snapped his fingers, and Adam and Eva were dressed in white and black kimonos. Much better. When Lucifer spoke again, his voice sounded tired, and he didn't seem sure of his words. Not even we ourselves can explain how we ended up in your being. You were like a light to four very powerful and ancient moths. Your body has an energy that is not a kosei in itself, said Lilith. The truth, Izuku, is that you are not defenseless in this cruel world with people. I'm not? Izuku asked. Lucifer changed his tired face to one of anger as he grabbed Lilith by the shoulder, causing her to complain and scream while, with his physical strength, the angel forced her to her knees. Leave her. Begged Izuku, approaching him and pushing him. Let's stop fighting among ourselves, growled Eva, placing herself between Lucifer and Lilith. Izuku thought that this face did not match the angelic face, appearance, and aura of the woman in the slightest. She sighed. What my? And is trying to say, Izuku, is that you have a great amount of chi. Chi? Izuku asked, eyebrows raised by Adam, Lilith, and Lucifer. Chi is the flow of life energy of every human being, explained Eva. Lucifer, he was the first angel of creation. Adam was the first human, Lilith was created to be Adam's companion and equal in every aspect, and I was created when Lilith left creation, she sighed. All living beings have a certain amount of life energy. We can use chi in ways that no other human could use, said Lucifer. My level is extremely high, being the first angel of creation. You four are only restricted by your mortal bodies. Lilith gave her husband a look of superiority. Lilith began as just another human, but using her connection with the Creator. She acquired some special powers, at Lucifer's level, and she left me, Adam said seriously before laughing in Lilith's face, who seemed to want to kill him. There are three forms of chi, Lilith added, pitching in. Divine or luminous, Lucifer's, mortal, Adam and Eve's, and demonic, mine. My chi literally is luminous, were Lucifer's words, showing a sphere of light in his hand, which soon turned into golden fire. Light and fire. I'm Lucifer after all, a smile appeared on his lips. I am the bearer of light. Eva explained. Angels are made of light and air. Divine air, called ether. Lilith explained further. Humans. Or at least, Adam and I, we were created from clay, so our chi is connected to the elements of the earth, both literally, earth, like that from which plants sprout, and water. Lilith extended her right hand, and a rock lifted from the ground. Right now, we are in your mind. And here, Izuku, you will learn to do these things. She closed her fist, and the rock turned into fine earth. I was created first, said Adam, scratching his neck. I have access to a totally unique ocular ability, the Lord's eyes, also called, theology. They allow me to copy any physical technique, I could copy, for example. All mites or death arms moves. Izuku looked at him with starry eyes. Your body is healed 100%, Izuku, said Eve. You can leave this prison. How do you know? Izuku asked, looking at her confused. My inherent power transferred to you when I accepted you as my son, becoming your kosei, celestial healing, Eva explained. Son? Izuku asked, and it was Eva who hugged him. She hugged him, allowed him to cry on her shoulder, 
to call her mother or Okasan. Adam looked at Lucifer with a smile as the first angel pushed him forward. Adam said with his eyes, What are you doing? He is Eva's son now, and he is also your paternal responsibility, said Lucifer. Adam joined the hug. For my part, kid, you'll have my photokinesis. Photokinesis? Izuku asked. You'll release light from your hands, but I'll also teach you to shape it, said Lucifer, showing an axe made entirely of golden light at the end of a rod. Izuku settled into the house. Thanks to Lilith's Kose, which he named Live Tattoo, his life in the following years would be quite comfortable. This Kose allowed Izuku to create all kinds of animals or creatures, which he sent out to get things for him, clothes, food, educational and school books, to continue his education, and so on. He learned to cook with Eva, who instructed him to steal fruit and vegetables and learn to eat, sometimes through blows, and other times, through sparring matches, with the loser doing what the winner commanded. He studied heroes and villains, and stole their best moves, thanks to Adon's eyes of the Lord, who subjected him to long and grueling physical training to gain endurance, flexibility, and muscle strength. He learned to manifest wings of light or darkness, from the Kose granted by Lilith and Lucifer. He learned to create weapons made from fire slash light or darkness. Izuku learned that Eva had another Kose, one very similar to what the hero Kamui Woods did, but she told him that it wouldn't be his, but for someone he would meet in the future, and they would be happy together. Izuku completely unaware that there were people searching for him everywhere. He didn't know that there were people who cared about him. People like the Bakugos or even his own mother, who truly regretted her actions, too late though, several years too late. Izuku was forced to learn stealth, to mask his scent, to blend into his surroundings, and thus continue his studies at Kishitsu Elementary. Sometimes, he used the live tattoo, sending tiny insects to the classrooms to listen to the teacher's lessons so he could keep learning. Other times, he blended into the bushes and shadows, listening, learning, and taking notes. He already knew which high school he would attend, Onokawa, one of the most demanding and prestigious high schools. He knew that everything he was doing so far would be worth it. A year passed, and both Eva and Lilith bid farewell to Izuku, Adan, and Lucifer, saying they were being guided to their counterparts, to the people they should have transmigrated into. Those were Lilith's words. But Eva was much more. Lilith and I will do for two girls what we did for you, Izuku-kun, will assist two girls and perhaps, just perhaps, they'll also receive our kose, although they already belong to you and are already a part of you, especially mine, they too, one way or another, will be your soulmates, see you, darling. Izuku knew life would be extremely interesting in the future. And he was quite right when luck struck him head on twice. On the first day of classes at Onokawa, he was discovered by the school principal, who asked him to accompany him to his office. There, a embarrassed Izuku told him he was a homeless child who just wanted to study. The man surprisingly showed understanding to Izuku, congratulated him for his eagerness to study despite the precarious way he had to live, and gave him a notebook, textbooks, and a uniform, telling him he would start studying in two days, and he would speak with the teacher. Izuku left, deciding to trust a stranger blindly. Two days later, Izuku arrived somewhat nervous at the classroom, where the teacher was waiting for him and had him enter, letting him know that everyone already knew his little story, making him introduce himself to his future classmates and sit next to a pretty girl with long green hair, like vines. The girl's name was Shiazaki Ibura. As they approached each other, they both felt something. A kind of pull. An instinct that told them they had to be together. The girl was the final transmigration of Eva's soul. And he was that of Adon. They were connected. It was almost, almost, as if they were soulmates. Izuku and Ibura became friends quickly. They both loved how the other was so passionate about a particular topic. Izuku was obsessed with heroes, and villains, always eager to watch fights to learn their moves, especially if they were martial artists or had powers related to fire or light. Ibura, on the other hand, was passionate about the Judeo-Christian religious theme. Although she was Christian, her fascination lay in the apocryphal Book of Enoch and other apocryphal writings. She shared how her family's Catholic background led to a personal crisis, pushing her to atheism temporarily. However, she bounced back, delving into apocryphal texts, which shaped her unique outlook on life and spirituality. One ordinary day in a random park. Izuku. Called Ibura, interrupting Izuku's training and punishment session with a tree, which already had several dents from Izuku's powerful punches and shadowy weapons. Hey, Ibura-chan. Izuku greeted with a smile. I want to show you my special moves, okay? 
asked the girl with vine-like hair. Of course, he replied happily. Over time, his hair had become a strange mix of straight and wavy, styled somewhat like Adam's but longer, reaching his shoulder blades. Via Dolorosa, exclaimed Ibera as her hair extended all around her, Inquisition. The thorns from Ibera's vine-like hair grew, becoming deadly. Via Dolorosa, Inquisition, murmured Izuku with a smile. A very interesting and deadly move, painful way, Inquisition. Your turn, said Ibera with a smile. It took Izuku a moment to understand what Ibera wanted, but he eventually stood in a Muay Thai stance in front of another tree, surrounded by a golden aura. Twilight Meteor Group. Izuku was swift and precise, leaving many craters in the tree before it fell. Ibera remained silent for a moment. Great. Thanks, he said, scratching his head nervously and blushing. Come on, let's find something to eat, he suggested, trying to ease the unusual situation. He wasn't used to receiving compliments. Sure, she said with a smile. Let's find a restaurant. They began walking out of the park. Did you know that the Gospel of Matthew, in its fourth verse, says, Man shall not live by bread alone? Also by the word, which is spiritual bread and comfort. Or something like that, Izuku replied. Ibera nodded satisfied. They continued walking towards a bakery across the street in the same park. As they crossed safely and approached the bakery, they heard. Let her go someone shouted not far away. They saw a column of fire rising into the sky. Ibera and Izuku exchanged glances and ran in that direction. When they arrived, they found a blue-skinned villain holding a black-haired girl in his arms. In front of them, a girl with short violet hair knelt. Let her go. K. Kyoka. The black-haired girl called, a trickle of blood appearing at her mouth from the force of the blue-skinned villain's grip. Hey kid, someone behind the girl called Kyoka. It was. All right, Necromancer is here, Izuku whispered. Necromancer. You won't be fast enough to save her, the villain said, laughing. The hero laughed too. She's an outsider. Why would I bother saving her? He's not fast enough. But I am, said a youthful voice behind the villain. The villain turned his head to see who spoke, only to receive a blow that shattered several teeth. How dare you? The villain growled, turning to attack the assailant, only to find no one there. Where are you? Painful way, Inquisition, exclaimed Ibera, ensnaring the villain with her vine-like hair, causing him to scream in pain. Here I am, said Izuku, now facing the villain. Twilight Meteor Group. The blows from Izuku's fists were as painful as few things had been for the villain until then, thanks to Izuku surrounding his fists with shadows as cold as minus 93 degrees Celsius. Damn you, the villain grumbled before Kyoka connected her jack connector lobes to the villain's neck, stunning him. However, the villain had enough control over his own body to crush the girl's head against the pavement, leaving the three children in shock. Don't let anger and the thirst for vengeance control or corrupt you, my girl, said a voice directed at Kyoka, recognized by Izuku. Lilith mom, Izuku whispered, recognizing the voice and finding a resonance in the girl with violet hair. Thousand shackles of darkness, exclaimed Kyoka as hundreds of black metal shackles emerged from her body, imprisoning the villain while a black aura surrounded the girl. Izuku, finish him, ordered Lucifer. Izuku reached out his hand toward the villain. One hundred incendiary arrows of divine light. A white light sphere formed in Izuku's hand before many golden arrows shot out, embedding themselves into the villain's body, making him scream. Hell's judgment, exclaimed Izuku slash Lucifer and Kyoka slash Lilith, as waves of fire and celestial light surged from Izuku's body, striking the villain. At the same time, ice and infernal shadows emanated from Kyoka's body, hitting the villain. The villain screamed as a hole opened in the ground, swallowing him. Necromancer passed out. That man doesn't deserve his kose, nor does he deserve to be a hero, said Adam. Approach him, Izuku. Approach him, Ibera, commanded Eva. Both parents of humanity compelled the supposed hero to open his eyes. Izuku's eyes turned golden. Ibera's eyes shifted from green to silver. Between the two green-haired children, they stripped the hero of his kose, forcing him to devolve, with Adam and Eve causing everyone to forget Sakamura Yuichi's existence. Izuku Midoriya stared blankly into space. Beside him sat his dear friend Ibera. Soon, the girl with violet hair appeared, tears in her eyes, accompanied by four adults, a woman with violet hair and glasses, with the same connector-shaped earlobes, Jiro Mika, Kyoka's mother. Alongside her, a man with blonde hair and very small black eyes, named Jiro Kiyotaku the girl's father. 
My husband and I want to thank you for saving our daughter, Mika said to the boy, who was still in shock. We do too, said a woman with black hair, next to a man with brown hair. You tried to save our daughter, and that. That was much more than what Necromancer did. You're a true hero, kid. I'm sorry I couldn't react sooner, was all the boy said, clearly still in shock. We both deeply regret it, said Ibera, passing a hand over her friend's shoulder. You did everything you could to save our daughter, said the woman, who, although very saddened, couldn't blame these children for their inability to save her daughter. It could never have been your fault. Especially. Me, whispered Kyoka. Izuku and Ibera didn't think they would cross paths with Kyoka again, but the park where they used to have fun wasn't far from the home of the girl with violet hair, so a reunion was bound to happen sooner or later. They became friends through pain. Izuku and Kyoka grew much closer. They felt that only the other could understand their thoughts. Only Lucifer could understand Lilith. Only Izuku could understand Kyoka. What are you thinking about, Izuku? Kyoka asked softly one day when they were alone. Without Ibera. Completely alone, in the park. When they told me I was a Mukasei, my mother focused on my sister, Hikari, Izuku said. She stopped. Stopped feeding me, stopped dressing me. And one day, some people tried to mug us. She took Hikari with her. Only because my sister had a kosei. Locked up with them, I discovered my first. My first ability. A gift from Eva, Adam's second wife, humanity's mother. Eva granted me a kosei that allows me to regenerate and heal others. Adam granted me an ocular kosei, it allows me to copy martial arts techniques from any enemy. Lilith granted me two kosei. Or maybe it was just one, split in two, shadow manipulation and giving life to animals. He extended his arm, and a monkey emerged from the ink shaping the tattoos covering his body, the animal climbed onto Izuku's shoulder. Lucifer gave me light manipulation. Lilith and Eva said that I was. The transmigration of the souls of Lucifer and Adam, and they had to find their own. Counterparts, the people whose souls would complement theirs. Ibera. Kyoka barely mentioned. She is Eva. She closed her eyes for a second, smiling. And I, I am Lilith. The first. Feminist in history? The woman who decided not to follow the orders of her soulmate and God, and who escaped to the Red Sea, where she would find demons, Izuku summarized quickly. The story goes that she became Asmodeus's partner, but in reality. A smile adorned the lips of the short-haired purple-haired girl. Her husband was Lucifer. Asmodeus never touched her. Hello, Queen, Izuku whispered barely. Hello, King, Kyoka whispered. Unbeknownst to them, their shadows took on demonic features before returning to normal. Izuku learned from Kyoka how to play some rock instruments. Kyoka learned from Izuku how to take notes. Especially about heroes, just as Izuku did. And one day, they sought to do something good when they left school and heard an explosion. They decided to go see, finding Ibera and seeing that a slime monster had a hostage. Izuku's eyes widened in surprise. It was a boy he already knew, but he hadn't seen him in many years. Cream-colored blonde hair and red eyes, explosions escaping from his hands. Izuku? Ibera whispered, seeing him tremble slightly and clench his fists. Do you know him? Kyoka asked in the same whisper, a voice they both already knew. No, Ibera replied. It took Izuku a few minutes to admit it. Yes. Bakugo Kasuki, my old friend, and then he became my bully when I thought I lacked a kosei. Coward, shouted a tall, muscular hero with a square jaw, small black eyes, grey spiky hair, and a black and yellow headband. He wore a blue shirt that only covered his arms, leaving his torso bare, with heavy metal bracelets on his wrists. Death arms, Izuku thought. Death arms threw a punch, but his hand was absorbed by the monster. What is this? He asked, trying to escape. I can't hurt it. Lethal 504. Advised Izuku with crossed arms, secretly intending to copy the hero's special move. He sent a crow and a spider, created from the life tattoo, to observe the movement so he could copy it if he wished. Well thought, kid. The hero quickly punched with his left hand before trying to grab the slime monster's face and slam it, but being a slime, it was impossible. I can't grab it. Useless. The slime shouted, whipping the hero with a tentacle, sending him flying. Here she comes. A woman shouted. The rookie hero, Mount Lady. But the blonde with gigantism Kosei suddenly stopped. Oh no. I need two lanes. Kamui Woods pulled out two of Katsuki's friends, whom Izuku recognized. 
I'm not good with explosions, I can only get these people out of here. I'll have to leave it to someone else. Useless, Izuku thought angrily, crossing his arms. I'm very busy here, said Backdraft, the firefighter hero, trying to put out several fires. Not only is it difficult to catch that guy, but the kid keeps using his kose, said Death Arms. This is a minefield. Commented Dragon Freak, due to Katsuki's constant explosions and the flames ignited by the blonde. It's a triple threat. It's useless, said Death Arms. We can only hope for a hero with a more suitable kose to arrive. I've seen enough of this, growled Izuku, stepping forward, then another. Izuku, no. Kyoka and Ibera shouted, grabbing his shoulders, but he freed himself and walked forward. Stay back, kid. Called Backdraft as he saw the green-haired boy pass behind him. You're not even putting out the fire, Backdraft, the boy complained as he raised his hand to the sky and released a cold wind and a layer of ice, a variation of the other power Lilith had granted him, Umbrakinesis. Thanks to the demonic power of ice and cold wind, the fires began to extinguish. If angels were created from light and fire and can release both when fighting. It will almost seem poetic if demons do the same. He pondered silently. All Might arrived at the scene, but a cloud of smoke surrounded him, leaving only a tall, skinny man. Seeing two young girls witness his transformation made him very nervous. He brought a hand to his lips. They looked at each other and then at the blonde man, pale and thin as a skeleton, with much confusion. A boy is a hostage of the slime villain? Damn, was all he could think. Go away, kid, shouted the slime villain, throwing a punch at Izuku, who dodged it before snapping his fingers. Everyone watched as a green crow-like creature emerged from his body and grabbed Katsuki by the shoulders, flapping its wings until it managed to free him. Die! The villain created a muscular arm. Idiot! Stop! shouted Death Arms as he watched Izuku dodge his enemy's blow. What do you call that? Izuku asked mockingly. Slime right? The villain formed many tentacles, which Izuku began to dodge. Adam's right. Uck! groaned the monster as it was hit, just before realizing. Did you just hurt me? He asked, scared. That running down your head, I presume. That grey stuff. Is it blood? Only then did the villain notice it. Memories of Adam's battles flooded Izuku's mind. Against the snake demon Samael, who lied to the Divine Council, blaming Eve for eating the apple. The fight against the angel Jophiel, who remained as the gatekeeper of Eden and refused to let them collect the fruits when they asked because they lived in the desert, but Adam beat Jophiel, boldly entered Eden, and returned to Eve's side, laden with fruits and edible plant leaves. The fight against the angel Ragel, who delivered divine justice against Cain and marked him after Abel's murder. Although Adam did not forgive his son Cain, he did not allow Ragel to kill him, and he could only leave a scar on the first murderer. Ragel received a beating. The fight against Zeus, whom he destroyed, resulting in his death. Izuku left those memories behind, dodging by crouching before grabbing Katsuki's shoulder, pulling him away from the slime villain. He placed both hands on its belly and began freezing it, creating a huge ice cube. He heard cheers behind him. He glanced at the villain one last time, then walked away. Kid. Death arms began. Don't say a word, old man, Izuku interrupted first, looking at him with dead eyes, causing Dragon Geek and Death Arms to jump back. You did absolutely nothing. You were not helpful, except for allowing me to copy your special move, and then you were sent flying. The only one doing something useful was Backdraft. Talk to me again on the day you learn not to give up, even if everything is against you. They heard the ice shatter. A gust of wind passed them by. All Might? The scared monster asked. Professionals always risk their lives. All Might said. Detroit smash. He launched an uppercut, sending a gust of air upward. That green-haired kid was amazing, someone said. He froze it in a second. Another civilian said. And he was ready to attack again, with his strength enhancer. The first one said, punching the air. All might change the weather with just one punch. Someone else said. The upward punch created an air current and they collected the remains of the monster and handed them over to the police. Izuku and Katsuki were praised by the heroes. Only for Izuku to be scolded by Kyoka and Ibera, and the three of them walked away. Katsuki tried to follow his childhood friend, but the green-haired boy, along with those two girls, disappeared. All Might thought the boy would be a perfect successor, but simply, he and the girls vanished into thin air. When Izuku, Ibera, 
and Kyoka could see where they were, they were facing two people and a monitor in what seemed to be a bar. One of those people was a young man around 18 or 20 years old, with blue-gray hair, red eyes, and a face behind a severed hand. Beside him, a humanoid smoke being in a bartender's suit. The three prepared to fight. Hello, youngsters, said a voice from a black TV screen, labeled sound only in violet letters. We are the League of Villains. We witnessed the heroic rescue of that blonde-haired boy, and how the other heroes, including you, Midori-san, scorned him. We know how they mocked your vine-haired friend because of her. Let's say religious obsession, and how your friend was killed. Ibura, Izuku, and Kyoka clenched their fists. Kurogiri told me about your recent reluctance towards heroes, and he discovered that you are a great analyst of quirks. The mist man handed one of Izuku's books. Your observation skills have impressed me, boy, your friend's auditory abilities as well, and the raw power of the vine-haired girl. They looked at each other. I don't think you'll allow us to think about it, said Izuku, memories of how he was treated by his mother and sister for being a supposed quirkless, how he was tortured, how he was treated by the heroes, just moments ago, ran through his mind. Count me in. And me, said Kyoka, eager for revenge against the heroes for what happened to her childhood friend. Okay, said Ibra, but she wasn't so sure. She wanted to be a hero, she wanted to save others, not hurt them. Divine fury, hell's punishment, and purgatory are just a display of God's love for his children. The three villains fell silent. Izuku smiled at them, pointing his thumb at Ibra. Translate that as a yes. Kurogiri opened a portal and pulled out three notebooks. The man on the other side of the screen spoke again, your first full-time job will be to jot down the names of heroes or villains, their quirks names, and a description of that quirk. Understood, said Izuku. I'll tell you your second full-time job right away. The three young ones nodded, waiting for more instructions. Infiltrate UA and take notes on the students and teachers. Regardless of the two jobs, once a week, a portal from Kurogiri will open in your rooms for you to send the notes. In an apartment complex, several kilometers away. Mom! A girl shouted as she arrived home, exhausted from running to talk to her mother. To tell her what happened. Hello, Harumi-chan, did you have a good day at school? Inko asked calmly and smiling. The katsudon is all ready. I saw Onizen. The girl exclaimed, leaving the woman stunned, her eyes sparkling with joy. He used a icy wind quirk to put out a fire and then used an ability-enhancing quirk. An ability? Enhancer? Inko asked, confused. Harumi nodded, a smile adorning her face. He ran really fast to the villain, to save Kachan, dodging and counterattacking with great strength, agility, and speed, and then he froze the villain. Where did you see him? Inko asked, in a blink she disappeared from in front of Harumi and now was grabbing her shoulders. Is he okay? She asked her mother, before bombarding her with questions. Did you see if he has any scars? Did he tell you if he's studying, or where he's living? We didn't. Talk. I saw him from afar. And no. He didn't seem to have any scars. She answered as best as she could. I. Was walking here, but I saw an explosion in the distance, and decided to go see what happened. Kachan was trapped by a slime monster. No hero could do anything, just put out the fires that the monster forced Kachan to cause. Onizen put out the fires with ice and then faced the villain barehanded, managing to defeat it, and saving Kachan. But. Her joy and excitement faded as she thought about it. Two girls went to him, when I looked for him, they had already disappeared. Midoriya Izuku, Shiyazaki Ibura, and Jiro Kyoko went back to their homes, thanks to Kurogiri's portals. But they got right to work on their hero information gathering, especially Izuku, who was a huge hero fan and very good at describing things in detail. Kurogiri often sent them to fight villains they found in alleys, as long as they had quirks similar to theirs. Izuku used his quirk, one for all, focusing the energy into his arms and legs to boost his strength. He trained at a legal gym with legal trainers, building a strong but lean physique, not bulky like Schwarzenegger or Stallone. Time passed, and the three of them stood before the gates of UA Kyoka smiled. I always dreamed of coming to this school, you know? Her friends looked at her, and she closed her eyes, smiling arrogantly. Just that. Just that you never imagined it from the other side. I get it, Izuku said. We need to qualify as heroes to start our work, Ibera said, linking arms with her friends. Girls, Izuku said, and they both looked at him. Try not to be too obvious. 
Ibera and Kyoka exchanged glances before giving a nod to the only guy in the trio. They entered a room where, without much explanation, they were given a pencil, a sharpener, an eraser, and a two-page exam, which they started answering immediately. When the written test finished, present Mike stood at the podium. You've finished the written test, now on to the physical. I'm sure you all want to join the hero department, A and B, right? Cheers erupted, hands in the air. But there are other departments, C, D, and E are general education. F, G, and H are support, focusing on developing support teams for heroes on the battlefield. It's a creative environment like no other. And finally, I, J, and K are management, focusing on the business side of heroes, even managing hero agencies. Present Mike paused for a minute to ensure they all understood. Now, you all need to show what you're made of, so give it your all, understood? You have 10 minutes to face three types of enemy robots, each labeled with points. Destroy as many as you can. Oh, and of course, attacking other applicants or doing anything non-heroic will result in immediate disqualification. Everyone rushed to their designated areas, and after five minutes, the doors opened. What are you waiting for? Present Mike shouted. In a real battle, there's no waiting around. Go, go, go. All the applicants ran into the city and began searching for villains. I just hate not having wings, Izuku thought as he pulled out his book of poetic quotes by William Blake. He found that poems calmed Ente, the demon created by the life tattoo. No bird soars too high if he soars with his own wings, he read. Some tattoos peeled off and formed a vulture, lifting Izuku into the air, speeding him towards a type I robot. The vulture shot its feathers, piercing the robot and making it explode. Let's descend, Griffin. The bird brought him back to the ground, throwing feathers and destroying three type I robots. The moon, like a flower in the sky, with silent delight, sits and smiles at night, he recited, summoning a five-meter wolf and panther that crushed two type two robots each before the wolf roared and destroyed two type two and one type three robots. Fourteen points, he continued until he encountered a pair of type two robots, but they were destroyed by Kyoka's sound waves, making him smile. He dashed into an alley and tackled a Type 2 robot, using one for all to destroy it in one blow. Izuku saw a girl with short brown hair and matching eyes touch three robots, making them levitate before clapping her hands. Release. The three robots shattered. 28 points. He spotted that rule-abiding guy, square glasses and a blue sports suit, jumping and kicking, destroying a Type 3 robot. 44 points. Izuku called upon Griffin, and it lifted him into the air, seeking more villains, landing him amidst several. He activated theology and unleashed a barrage of punches at a level 2 robot, causing it to show signs of damage before being thrown away, destroying three robots, two of them were level 2, and the last one he couldn't discern. Life tattoo, theology. The teachers must be going crazy trying to figure out my kosei, he thought as he went in search of more robots. Turning a corner, he saw Ibera capturing three robots with her hair and then slamming them to the ground before cutting them with a powerful strike from her vines, then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. John 19 1-5, Ibera said as she saw two robots emerge from the alleys and head toward her. Quickly touching the ground, she trapped the robots within enormous carnivorous plants that disposed of them. Didn't even see their points. Anyway, I must keep going. Good job, Izuku thought as he looked for more robots. Slash slash slash. In a room filled with cameras, the teachers and the principal watched the students. The applicants are not informed about the number or location of villains, stated Principal Nezu, the founder of UA and regarded as the smartest person in the last 300 years. They have a time limit in such a large area, said Cementos, a male teacher who looked like a cement block with arms and legs, watching a boy named Tenya Ida running, thanks to some exhaust pipes in his calves giving him great speed. Knowing how to navigate large areas. Gathering information or even raw power, said Midnight, a teacher who seemed out of place due to her BDSM like attire, watching a boy with multiple arms, some of which had been replaced with ears or eyes, and Katsuki, who had blown up several robots. What about the boy who controls animals? Asked Vlad King, a large-sized teacher with white hair and a red suit. The one with green hair, in City A, Monitor 155, he specified. Let's see, said Nezu, rifling through the papers until he found Izuku's file. Applicant number 344. Name, Chonan Izuku. Age, 15 years old. Former student of Tokyo's second largest school, Gakko Kyoiku. The last piece of information surprised them all. Dot, 
As for his Kose. Nezu flipped the page and looked at the back of the first sheet. Well. This is very detailed, indeed. A smile appeared on the lolly's lips. Healing life, healing Kose, I can also regenerate organs. This Kose is directly connected to a Kose for physical strength enhancement, which the boy refers to as theology. And these two are related to a Kose of golden flames that can devour other fire Kose, called divine fire. And last but not least, life tattoo, his tattoos come to life, he only needs to imagine the creature, but they can become very aggressive, so he uses poetry to calm them down. A few months ago, a boy named Katsuki Bakugo was taken hostage by a mud villain. Professionals either couldn't do anything because the villain took control of Bakugo's kose or because of civilians in danger. The boy was about to lose his life, and my time was running out. Everyone looked at All Might, momentarily horrified, until they saw him smile. That boy, Shonan Shonen, saved Bakugo Shonen. He acted when no professional did. That boy. Is remarkable. Slash slash slash. Kyoka used only her biological kose, earphone jack. Her earlobes were headphone jacks, and she could send sound waves against her enemies, as well as hear things from afar. She wouldn't use her dark ice, reserving it only for her villain identity. 125. All right. I hope Izuku and Ibra are doing well, she thought, rolling forward to dodge a level 2 robot and seeing a pair of level 3 robots in front of her. She connected the headphones to the level 2 robot and rapidly made her heart beat, causing an explosion and sending the robot parts towards her enemies. 133. I hope it's enough. Everything began to shake. What? What's happening? She wondered as she tried to maintain balance, but it was impossible. She saw buildings collapsing and an immense robot appearing. That. That's. The zero points, it seems, affirmed Lilith. I don't think your sound waves will suffice to defeat it. Shall we summon a demonic army or will you use my infernal power? Neither of them. We're just getting out of here, affirmed Kyoka as she ran. Slash slash slash. When she saw it, Harumi opened her eyes in disbelief at what was in front of her. She couldn't move, she was terrified, about to be crushed by that thing. She would die because of that robot. Then, she felt someone take her hand and make her run. It was a girl with short brown hair and eyes of the same color. But both were crushed by a slab, and their screams were heard. Their screams were heard by Izuku, who turned, looked at them, and his eyes widened. There's no merit in finishing off this villain, were present Mike's words. But those two girls will be crushed, said Adam, or perhaps it was Lucifer, or perhaps. It was simply his conscience. No father would ignore his children if they were in danger, Adam affirmed. Izuku knew that this time he did hear Adam speaking to him. Izuku ran, snapping his fingers, his hair changing from green to white as tattoos peeled off his body, taking the form of an anthropomorphic demon with a pair of horns typical of a marger, being the size of the zero points, and crushing the robot after delivering three powerful blows, then descending while the robot slowly disintegrated, arriving at the place where Harumi and the girl were, both injured. With one blow, Izuku destroyed the rock and dragged them out from underneath. That boy destroyed the zero points with that monster, said a boy. He didn't destroy it because he wanted to, Baka, said a girl, annoyed with the boy. Look at those two girls over there. He saved them, said another girl, surprised and proud. That boy is a true hero. The fox condemns the trap, not itself, Izuku read from his book as he closed it. It's written. Great job, said a woman around 27 years old with brown hair, wearing a pink helmet and a doctor's coat. The woman handed something to a young man. Here, have some candies. Oh, thank you very much, said the young man, scratching his head, somewhat embarrassed. That mademoiselle is the backbone of UA, the youth hero, recovery girl, said a blonde guy with European features, and from his words, apparently had some French ancestry, though also Japanese features. Izuku. Niazan, said Harumi in shock, looking at her brother before her, and the brown-haired girl. Did. Did you summon that thing? Yes, was all he said, in a rather cold tone that sent shivers down both their spines. Are you hurt? I have some scrapes, said Harumi, before looking to her right, avoiding looking into her brother's cold eyes, which made her feel a bit fearful. But. This girl. Izuku nodded. Don't worry, you'll be fine, the boy touched the broken leg of the girl, while a green aura surrounded the brunette, healing her. Incredible, I'm already feeling better, said the girl, moving her foot several times. We read your file, Chonan-san, said recovery girl, smiling at him. 
So this is your healing life. Exactly, recovery san, said Izuku as he stepped aside. Yes. Great healing work, she affirmed, looking at the previously injured leg of the girl. Incredible, whispered an incredulous Harumi as she watched Izuku and recovery girl, healing several people. Healing Kosei, super strength, creature creation, but how? Slash slash slash. The three infiltrators of the League of Villains in UA received positive responses from the Hero Academy. They would be at the forefront of hero training and could gather information about the students for the League. Sensei's plan was perfect. A week later, the response from UA arrived. Chonan Izuku, Jiro Kyoka, Shizaki Ibura. Midoriya Harumi. They were admitted to UA. Izuku's last name is formed by the Japanese words Chonan, which means first son. As you have noticed, Izuku left out the Dark Ice Kosei, or Infernal Ice, the second demonic power bestowed upon him by Lilith, as it is this Kosei that he will use in his villain identity. Midoriya Harumi didn't know what would happen that day. She wasn't sure if she really wanted to go or stay safe at home. Her dream was always to be a hero, but she ended up becoming her brother's personal villain. And now, her brother had made it to UA through his own efforts. He had a high number of Kosais, showing how powerful he was. Was she up to the challenge? Harumi-chan, her mother said, catching her attention. You'll do fine. Both of you will. I hope so, Harumi said, sighing as she headed towards UA the acceptance rate for the hero course at UA High is less than 1 in 300 each year. Apart from the four recommended students, 36 are admitted through regular exams. Those 38 students are divided into two classes, with 18 in each. She thought to herself. Class 1A, 1A. This place is huge. Her words trailed off as she arrived at the classroom door. She opened the immense door and entered the classroom, paying no attention to Katsuki arguing with that straight-laced guy, but instead looked at Izuku. She didn't realize how much she had expressed her thoughts. Niazan. Everyone jumped in their seats. Too much noise, complained a girl with half-red, half-white hair, one brown eye, and one gray eye. Harumi approached Izuku with a smile, but he looked at her with his quirk activated and dodged her hug attempt. Midoriya. Don't you dare hug me, Izuku said coldly. Harumi jumped back at her brother's tone. Griffin emerged from Izuku's tattoos and pecked at Harumi's face, making her retreat in fear, and she went to sit down. I'm Ida Tenya. I attended Samei Junior High. You surprised me in the exam, discovering. If you want to play friends. Then stop wasting my time and leave, interrupted a scruffy-looking man with black hair, wearing a simple outfit, a black long sleeve shirt and black pants, though he had a very odd grey scarf around his neck. He held a yellow sleeping bag in his right hand. This is the hero course. I know this is sudden, but... He reached into the sleeping bag and pulled out some strange suits. Put on your gym uniforms and let's head to the courtyard. Today, we're going to... At the same time, All Might, in his skinny form, was reading the UA rule book. The UA system is not predefined. Depending on your professionalism, the first day may be. Do a Kosei assessment test? Everyone asked, somewhat confused. What about the entrance ceremony? Or orientation? Asked Uraka. If you're going to become heroes, then you don't have time for that kind of thing, said Aizawa. UA is a school that's lenient about its traditions. Just like the teachers, we carry out the classes. You've been doing this since school, sports. Softball, races, 50-meter dashes, etc. However, in schools, you're not allowed to use your quirks. That's irrational. Unfortunately, I'm not in charge of the Ministry of Education. Chonan, you finished first in the practical exam, right? In school, what was your best result in softball? Maybe. 60 meters. Aizawa handed him a ball. Throw this with any of your quirks. Understood, he said as he grabbed the ball, activated his quirk, then sent that divine energy to his legs. He threw the ball into the air and took a combat stance. Axe divine. The kick caused even a sonic boom. Quirk, theology. This is the rational way to act, said Aizawa, showing the result. 710.5? Asked a surprised blonde boy. Aizawa looked at his list of students. Asui. Suyu. Ribbit. You'll say, sensei, said the girl with long, straight green hair tied up like a bun. She caught the ball and threw it into the air, crouching down with her hands and one leg on the ground before also kicking. Are you an expert in capoeira martial art? Aizawa asked. Yes, I am, she affirmed, smiling. 
710.4. Looks fun, said a girl with pink hair and skin. Looks fun, huh? Asked Aizawa. Will you be able to maintain that mood for the next two years, for second and third year? Whoever gets the lowest score will be labeled without potential and will leave. But it's only the first day, said a girl with brown hair. But heroes must face villains, weather disasters, and other kinds of problems, these are what the world faces, said Aizawa. Only the greatest and most wonderful heroes graduate from UA we, the teachers, are free to set the circumstances for our students. Izuku used theology in his legs again to run. Competing with him was Tenya, who had engines in his legs. Izuku managed to beat him by two steps. It's hard to use it all. Yes. You're right, said Tenya. Here. I can only go in third gear. Bakugo had no trouble because he used his explosions to propel himself forward. Todoroki Shizuka used an ice path, similar to Iceman from X-Men, and tilted it slightly to be faster. Kyoka accumulated sound waves, which she then released in a burst, causing an explosion and flying past the finish line faster than Kaminari. Sound is faster than light. Curious, thought the purple-haired girl before noticing something about Kaminari. Curious. If he uses too much power. He becomes extremely stupid. Kaminari Denki. It will be important to note and pass on the information from class A1, while Ibero will pass on the information from class B1. Ochako was faster than Aoyama, who fired a beam from his stomach. Mina used her acid to move across the ground, faster than Momo. In strength, the strongest was Mezo Shoji. Izuku might have seemed the best at ball throwing if it weren't for Uraka Ochako, who lifted the weight from her ball, achieving infinity. The best in lateral movement was Minoru Mineta, who gathered a bunch of balls from his hair, placing a cluster of balls, left and right, and then leapt from one to another. And though Mineta was the worst, Aizawa said that everyone had managed, in one way or another, to overcome and devise ways to pass the tests. And they would find the details on sheets on their desks in the classroom. That same night, a shadow managed to break into UA she knew where the cameras were, so she didn't have to worry about them. And for the cameras she couldn't avoid, she covered them with tree leaves as she continued her way, causing the leaves to wither. Opening the door to the camera and file room wasn't difficult for her, she only needed. UA was much more than just a school where they would learn to throw punches and save people. After all, it was a high school. Present Mike was the English teacher, and behind him, there was a board with four phrases written on it. Get excited, everyone. Present Mike requested. You can do it. Go ahead, Yaoyorozu san. The relative pronoun is in the wrong place in the fourth option, said Momo. Present Mike. Yamada Hizashi. By using his quirk, voice, not only does he increase the volume of his voice, causing loud and high-pitched sounds, Izuku thought as he wrote everything down on small colored sheets, which he would later send. If there are earth users, for example, hiding beneath it, then they could confront him. Another way would be by distracting him. After three classes, it was lunchtime. Ibera Chan, over here. Called a smiling Kyoka, catching the attention of some students from class B1, like Itsuka Kendo, Yanagi Reiko, and Kodai Yui. Kyoka Chan, Izuku kun, I'll join you as soon as I can, I promise, said a calm Ibera, indicating that she would go get her lunch. The students from class A1 and class B1 sat down and chatted for a bit. After a long and enjoyable chat, except for that guy Manoma Nato, everyone went back to their respective classrooms. What's next, Izuku kun? Asked Kyoka. The green haired boy looked at the back cover of his notebook. Basic training and heroics. The door opened. I am. Everyone recognized the voice, and they saw him stick his torso in. Entering through the door like a normal person. Really, All Might is a teacher, exclaimed an excited Ajiro, standing up and raising his arms in the air, smiling. He's impressive and imposing, exclaimed Mina, so excited that she was punching the air. Is that his Silver Age costume? asked Suyu, bringing a hand to her chin as she looked at the red and blue outfit. His style is so different. This will be wonderful, said Masharao, the blonde boy with a tail, who started throwing punches in the air. I'll give you the basic hero training. All Might said, smiling at his enthusiastic students. This will be the class you'll have the most time for, and that's because we'll cover a lot of ground over the next few days. It'll be a different way to cover the basics of being a hero. Let's get straight to the point, and for that, here are. He activated a remote control, and a wall unfolded some shelves, on which there were some briefcases. Your hero costumes. 
they're based on your quirk records that you submitted before classes started. Everyone grab their respective costumes. After changing, meet me in the beta testing zone. Yes, sir. They all said. Izuku was the last one ready. Although his costume wasn't anything spectacular. It had a long, sleeveless, open leather coat tied in the front with laces. It was green with vertical golden details and green pants. One, he had gloves with steel knuckles to hit his enemies harder. A white light suddenly appeared when everyone left. Only when Izuku was alone. Pleasure to greet the one adopted by Adam, the woman said to Izuku. Finally, the green-haired boy could see the woman before him. She was young, short, and slender, with short dark hair, blue eyes, square framed glasses, wearing an Italian scholar's hat, a white cape with a violet interior, and a short dress. Izuku gave her a smile. Welcome, Regin Leaf. The boy extended his right hand, which transformed into a knuckle duster for his right hand. Ready to go back into battle, even if it's against other humans? I am faithful to justice, and I know that humans are not perfect, but someday, you will be perfect, and I will accompany you on this journey. Izuku took his time to reply. Thank you. The eternal smile of All Might only grew when he saw his class 1A students emerge from that tunnel. Look at yourselves and convince yourselves of my words. From now on, all of you are heroes. Kyoko wore violet and green headband headphones, a black jacket with vertical and horizontal lines of green on the arms and sides of the jacket. Underneath, she wore what looked like a typical professional skating outfit, with violet in the center and black on the sides. Todoroki Shizuka was a girl with long hair, the right half of her hair was red and the left half was white. She wore a dark blue jacket that would withstand fire and ice, and she also wore a brown vest that would detect which quirk she used and heat or cool it accordingly. A belt with an extensive number of first aid compartments. Asui Tsuyu was a girl with dark green hair, so long that she tied it up like a bun. Her hero costume was a bright green turtleneck suit, cinnamon colored gloves with large buckles on each wrist protector, and two matching belts, one over her chest, a strap on each side that goes around her shoulders and another around her waist. Green embedded dots all around. Two black lines ran all over her suit, each framed in yellow, and she wore tight black boots with V-shaped marks on her thighs, green webbed fins resembling frog toes on her feet. She wore a headband, its color matching her gloves, and goggles with dark green tinted lenses on each side. Midoriya Harumi wore her costume in memory and honor of her brother. She hoped to one day be worthy of Izuku's forgiveness, so she decided to wear one of the first models her brother drew. It was a full body suit in spring green with white details. It also included a red belt and boots, black elbow and knee pads, and white gloves. On the head part, though she didn't always wear it, it had two holes for her eyes and two protrusions resembling long ears reminiscent of All Might's haircut. Around her neck, she wore a mask with a big smile on it. And finally, Izuku arrived, being the only student who had not yet arrived. I'm glad to see you all finally gathered, said All Might, with his eternal smile. Sensei, said Ida, who wore a white armor with black details on the shoulders, elbows, and legs. Since we're here, will we have urban battles again? I wish we could do that, sighed the man. But Director Nezu has asked me to take you one step further. Usually, it is thought that crimes happen in open places. That villains always appear on the streets. But if you look at the statistics, you'll find that there are many crimes in enclosed spaces. Imprisonment, house arrests, secret hideouts, and all sorts of deals behind the scenes. He clenched his right fist. In this world full of heroes. The real villains hide and pull the strings from the shadows. You will be divided into pairs, and you will have battles among yourselves. Without basic training? Asked Suyu, not as worried as she seemed. Sometimes, experience is the best teacher, said All Might. Noticing the penetrating gazes of many rivals, he swallowed nervously. I promise you that in our next class, we will have Muay Thai and boxing training. How will winners and losers be determined? Asked Yao Yorozu Momo. Can I blast them away? Asked Bakugo. Will there be expulsion punishment like in Aizawa Sensei's class? Asked Ochako. Don't you think this cape looks great on me? Asked Aoyama. No one paid much attention to him. I'll answer all your questions, said All Might, his fist trembling, as he pulled out a script. The villains must either protect the bomb or capture the heroes, and the heroes must capture the villains or physically touch the bomb. Everyone nodded, and then the blonde hero pulled out a bomb from somewhere on his back. The heroes and villains will be decided by lottery. Not all heroes who work together know each other, and sometimes villains work together only for convenience and nothing else. All Might extracted names from the boxes, 
forming the pairs. Then he pulled out two more boxes, one white labeled heroes in blue, and one black labeled villains in red. He extracted a sphere, and then another. Izuku and Kyoka, heroes, versus Katsuki and Harumi, villains. All right, Izuku, any ideas? asked Kyoka. Izuku thought for a moment before telling the girl with violet hair. I think. They might be on the top floor, guarding the bomb. And they would expect us to come through this door. He looked at her, then at Kyoka. They expect us to go floor by floor. They would never expect us to. Come straight at them. A smile appeared on Izuku's face. Or well, through a window. I like the idea, said Kyoka, embracing him. Izuku took out his book of poems, No Bird Flies Too High, If It Flies With Its Own Wings. The griffin crow appeared, growing in size and taking each of them by the shoulder with its claws, lifting them off the ground and carrying them to the terrace, where Kyoka opened the door with gentle sound waves, and they began their descent towards the floor where Katsuki and Harumi were. He leaned close to Kyoka's ear. Do you think you can render them unconscious? He whispered. I'm strong, Izuku, but not that strong, the girl lamented, but he showed her a smile and kissed her cheek. Attack them in a way that they're dizzy, then I'll send a gorilla to retrieve the bomb, and afterwards, I'll use the telemetry or other animals, Izuku whispered. Kyoka nodded as she connected her jack lobes to her boots and began releasing sound waves, causing sudden fatigue in the blonde and the green-haired girl, who either clung to the wall or sat down. Katsuki and Harumi were astonished when they saw the gorilla appear before them, the fox condemns the trap, not itself. Izuku read from his book. The gorilla grabbed the bomb. Deku, you bastard! growled Katsuki, dizzy, trying to run towards Kyoka and him, but he could only stumble, as if he were drunk, so he shot them with an explosion. Izuku and Kyoka barely had time to protect themselves behind a wall. You won't win, explosive, crazy, Izuku quickly invented nicknames for both. This. Is your end. We'll take you to prison. Shut up, I don't understand what you're talking about, Deku bastard. Katsuki lunged at Izuku and Kyoka. Before extending his right hand toward Izuku. Shine. But Izuku used the speed given to him by the telemetry, which improved his reflexes, endurance, speed, flexibility, and strength, to grab Katsuki's grenade-shaped wristband and push his arm aside, deflecting the explosion. Then he punched him in the cheek sending him to the ground. Katsuki launched an explosion, but Izuku and Kyoka managed to duck, while the corner of the room disappeared. Harumi's eyes widened when she saw her Izuku Niazan fighting Katsuki with martial arts, who was losing the fight by only wanting to focus on throwing explosions, which would soon cause the room to collapse. Kyoka quickly used her acoustic vibration to produce a low-frequency wave directed at Harumi, who had focused solely on her brother and Katsuki, and by not attempting to attack Kyoka, she was affected by the violet-haired girl's acoustic vibration, which caused her to feel dizzy and sit down, while the violet-haired girl approached the fire girl, who was no longer a threat, and handcuffed her hands with fake handcuffs. Time, shouted All Might. The bomb is no longer in the possession of the villains, and since it was a hero's acoustic vibration that removed the bomb from the location, and therefore, allowing its seizure by the anti-explosive police, the heroes win. V. X. Suit. 